Um, well, today we are doing a new experiment. Um, our local students aren't able to get here for their field trips because of the COVID-19 virus that's going around and they're all learning from home. So we are experimenting with this video tour uh, for the classes this year. Um, one of the things I like to mention is the, what the museum does. Uh, we collect artifacts and archives that show the history of Grant County. Um, an artifact could be defined as a 3D object that um, gives a clue to the way of life, to how people lived back in previous times. Archives are um, like paper objects. You would think of photographs, newspaper clippings, uh, and that sort of thing. And we collect all these together and we use them in exhibits and they help tell the story of Grant County. So when we get started on our um, video tour, we're just going to walk through the museum and I'll uh, tell a little bit about some of the different displays that we have. First, right here inside the corner, we have the Victor Sederland rune stone. You may or may not be familiar with the story of the Kensington rune stone that if you believe the if you believe the Kensington Moon Stone is genuine, it shows that the Vikings were here back in 1362, long before Columbus. If you don't believe it, if you believe it was a hoax, you believe it was done by a farmer in the Kensington area, um, the guy that discovered it. Victor Sederland was from Barrett, Minnesota. He did not believe in the prank, so he set out to create his own rune stone, and that's what we have here. Um, the markings you see are called runes and they spell out um, the inscription he put on this stone was 1776 four maidens set camp on this hill so that's what that's what the markings tell us on there he had experts looking at it for a long time um, finally one of the ex one of the guys checking into it, asked him if he had done it, and he said yes. He said, well, why didn't you say so before, after all these people coming from all over to study it? And he said, well, nobody ever asked me before. He was kind of a character that way. Back in this first area that we have, a lot of our prehistoric um, artifacts. Um, First, in this first case here, we have some mammoth bones uh, that were found in a gravel pit down by Herman in 1928. We have vertebrae, uh, which are parts of the backbone, and we have some teeth and parts of the tusk. Um, if you kids are familiar, ever watch the Ice Age movies and Manny the Mammoth, this is what we have here. Um, these were very large animals and you can maybe get an idea of how large they must have been by looking at the teeth. What you see here is one tooth. So you get, you know, it kind of just gives you an idea of how big, you know, to have a mouth that big, to have teeth like that size fit in your mouth. It's just kind of astonishing. <laughs> um, in this other display, we have just some things that show Grand County archeology span through the years, um, using some of the pottery shards and the arrowheads, and it kind of describes um, the archeology, span how, um, far back um, items have they've found um, in here. Different types of arrowheads arrow come from different time periods. On this wall we have a display of a 
a lot of arrowheads, pottery shards, uh, knife blades, things like that. Uh, most of these came from a site uh, on Barrett Lake. And what they had showed is that this site was continually occupied by natives um, for a period of going back like 10,000 years. In this case on, on the end, what I want to point out is the tips in our root. Um, this is a plant commonly called the prairie turnip. Um, grew wild out here on the prairies. The Indians used it for like a starchy root vegetable, kind of like a potato. Uh, the French fur traders that came through would use it the same, same way. They uh, translated it to palm, palm de terre or potato of the earth. Um, it's from this uh, root vetch, from this plant, from this root, that we get the name Tips and Mounds for the campground um, and the park and also Palm de Terre. Uh, Tips and was the Dakota word for that, uh, for that plant. And like I said, it was used kind of like what we would use potatoes as a starchy, uh, a starchy vegetable. Over on this side, I'm just going to point out, I know some of the classes in their social studies uh, groups, they talk about communities and probably change. And we have a lot of photographs that will, you can look at, and it shows how uh, communities have changed over the years just by looking at these Main Street pictures. Um, it shows how things have changed over the years uh, and just gives you an interesting look at what our towns used to look like. Another thing that I know that uh, is studied in your social studies, studies classes is the immigration and where people came from. The map that we've got up here is kind of put together map of Grant County. Um, and it shows the different colors indicate, this is from a 1900 map using the 1900 census. Um, it shows where where people came from. Uh, these kind of darker red colors, they were all the Norwegians or people descending from Norwegians. And you can see kind of spread, especially over the oh, east and northern part of the county. These areas of blue were, uh, were Swedes. That's where a lot of the uh, Swedes settled. You can see them concentrated, especially down in the Hoffman area. Uh, orange shows uh, Germans. Uh, the lighter, this lighter red color are people that were, uh, you could call them Yankees, you could call them, you know, they were people that their families had been here uh, for a number of years. Uh, they're probably two or three generations the Americans already that came up here. And, and you see that concentrated down in the Herman area. Uh, the Herman area was the first to get the railroad. So you had these people coming from the east that were already established and settling in that area. Um, areas that were left in white are areas that I couldn't determine um, just using the census where they came from. Some of it is land that was owned by um, like real estate companies or people that uh, were just trying to, to, to sell the land. So we couldn't really determine um, where those people came from. Okay. Over in this area, you see a lot of Native American artifacts. Um, we see in this one case, how they use common uh, items to, uh, to make tools where they use like bones to make, uh, there's a shoulder blade that they used, was used for a shovel. A deer antler could be made into a hole. Uh, birch bark was used for baskets and canoes. And the different stone um, 
implements in the arrowheads out of stone, uh, reed baskets. Um, anything that they needed, they made from what they had available. And um, we, uh, we have articles of clothing. Um, in this area, we had both the Ojibwe or Chippewa Indians and the Dakota or Sioux Indians who were kind of in a, a borderline area for the two tribes. And what you, uh, if you notice, when you're looking at the beading designs of the two, um, the Ojibwe Indians use more floral designs in their, um, in their beadwork whereas the Dakota Indians use more geometric designs in theirs. In this case, on this wall, we have um, some of the things that the fur traders uh, would trade to the Indians. The usually French uh, fur traders were the first white men that had contact with the natives in this area. Um, and they would trade things like guns and tools and kettles and beads and cloth to the Indians in exchange for furs. In these two cases that have the models of the horses, you'll see um, what I want you to notice is all the harnessing that goes into um, hitching these horses up to the different implements and wagons and buggies and such. Um, when the pioneers came, you know, everything was horses or even oxen before that for doing the, um, for breaking the soil and, and working the land. Um, and I'll point something out later on. Um, you see some of these models have the, the, on these horses, there's this netting that's across the back, and that was a horse fly net. Um, that at, and that was kind of help keep the keep the flies off and bo from bothering the horses while they were working. As the horse moved, that netting would also move, and that would kind of that would work to keep the horse the flies from bothering the horses as much. And we have one of those actual nets in when we get farther along in the tour in the back. So this is just more uh, examples of the horses and the harnessing and different implements. This January harvest this display that we have um, shows the process of harvesting ice every winter um, for almost, a, well, from 1894 to 1973, the Jelly Ice Company harvested ice from Barrett Lake. Uh, most of it was sold to the Sioux Line Railroad um, before, they, before refrigerated boxcars were commonplace. Uh, it, it goes through the steps that actually started in the fall of the year when they cut the weeds out of the area of the lake that they were going to harvest the ice from. Um, when the ice was thick enough, probably into the beginning of January, they would clear it off and then they would um, cut it into blocks that would, they would load then onto the uh, uh, railroad cars. And these blocks were sometimes I think it's like 600 pounds they're talking about. Um, Twenty by 22 by 32 inch blocks of ice, 400 to 500 pounds the blocks were. So mo like I said, most of this was sold to the railroad. There was some of it that was kept locally. Um, they could keep ice like in a, down in a dugout area and pack it in sawdust and that would keep so they would actually have ice in the summertime. This is our indoor log cabin display where you can see some of the things that the early pioneers might have had uh, maybe not right away when they um, built and moved here but later on. Um, we have over in the corner we have an old washing machine 
and um, some looms for spinning yarn. In the back is we have a, uh, a stove. And one of the things I want to point out in here, uh, when we were talking about the immigrants coming over, um, we have an immigrant trunk here. Um, when your ancestors came over, they generally would have to, um, when your ancestors came over, they had to really figure out what they were going to need right away and what they could wait and buy when they got here. Um, because when they came, it was pretty much a trunk like this for each person or um, for each adult, maybe had a trunk like this. For a family, you might have had two trunks. But everything you brought with you coming over the, overseas had to fit in the trunk. And that included your food for the voyage over here too, because that wasn't provided. Um, now when somebody moves, you know, you've probably packed up a moving van or, you know, if you're not moving too far, maybe you just, you know, loaded several truckloads moving from one house to another. Um, most people, if you're moving a distance, you're loading up a big van and packing up everything in your house to, to move. Um, back then, you know, granted they didn't have a lot to begin with, but everything they took had to fit into the trunk like this. Um, kind of a challenge, I would think, depending on, um, okay, what do you need? What can you buy later? Okay, over in this corner, we have our ox cart. It's probably our most prized possession as far as the museum goes. Um, it's the oldest, crudest, ox cart known to exist in the whole state. Um, you could tell rather than having spoke wheels um, as later carts had, this one had a wheel made out of solid wood. It had a wooden axle um, for it. Um, in the, like, well, I talked earlier a little bit about the the French fur traders um, being the first people with, uh, in, you know, first white people in this area. Um, they would trade, they would spend the winters trapping and hunting animals, trading uh, with the Indians for furs. And in the spring of the year, they would pile all these furs that they had gathered over the winter um, onto carts like this. And they would take them, they would be up in like Northwestern Minnesota, Northern Minnesota, and they would take them down to um, the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, St. Anthony at the time, probably, um, to sell those furs and then restock for the, for the following year. Um, in the spring of the year, they would have hundreds of these carts traveling to St. Paul um, at the same time, long trains, miles long, and um, with these carts, with the wooden wheels and the wooden axles, they made a lot of noise, a lot of high squeaking, squealing noise as they traveled. Um, they said you could hear them from miles away. You could hear them coming. Um, so what they did in order to kind of reduce the amount of noise, they would take snakes, frogs, fish guts, whatever they had available along the, the trail and they would shove that into the hubs to kind of grease the hubs so they didn't make quite as much noise as they traveled along. That's the point where you utilitary uh, exhibits. Uh, right inside the corner here we have a model of Fort Pond Terre. Um, in 1859 there was a stagecoach road that was built from St. Cloud to Fort Abercrombie uh, which is on the Red River. Uh, they needed overnight stops for this stage road, and one of them was set up at Pond uh, about a mile north of the north end of Pond Lake now. Um, 
In 1862, when the Dakota Indians, um, when there was the Dakota War, Dakota Uprising, uh, the Army came in and um, built the stockade. They fortified these overnight stage stops and uh, to protect the travel along the, along the stage road. Uh, so they came in, they built the stockade, they built a lot of these other buildings, barracks, um, block house, uh, uh, all the different soldiers' quarters and things like that. And um, this company of soldiers were uh, occupied the area for about uh, three or four years uh, until the issues with the Indians uh, settled down where they weren't needed uh, anymore. Um, during the time that the soldiers were at the fort, there were three soldiers that were attacked and killed by Indians. Uh, two of them were out uh, gathering goose eggs, kind of against orders. They were outside the stockade uh, to gather goose eggs, and they were ambushed and killed. And, and the third soldier was accompanying a, uh, a guy that was driving some cattle farther west, and they were also attacked and killed. Um, at the fort site, now, which is on private property, uh, there is a stone marker where the graves of the two soldiers killed near the fort uh, are buried. Uh, this line, we just have a whole line of uniforms. Uh, they represent um, from the Spanish-American War all the way up through our more recent uh, uh, conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. A lot of World War One, World War Two is represented, um, and it's kind of at this point where I like usually just let the kids come. This is our Civil War display that we have here. Uh, Grant County was named after General Ulysses S. Grant, so um, which kind of makes this a little more, bit more um, relevant to us, I think. Um, we have a, just a replica of one of his uniforms, a dress uniform. Uh, we have here a Civil War drum. The drummers were often just young boys, teen, young teenagers, and they would be in battle, and by the cadence that they drummed, it would be a signal to what they were supposed to, soldiers were supposed to be doing, charging, retreating, uh, whatever. Um, and in this display also, we have some Civil War era um, guns, sword, um, a mess kit. So back in this area of the museum, we have our larger displays, our automobiles, trucks, buggies, etc. Um, over in this first corner display, we have a harness shop. I mentioned before, um, you know, when you looked at those models of the, with the horses, all the harnessing that went into hooking those horses up to the equipment. So the harness shop was kind of an important uh, occupation to have available for the farmers. They, they could make and repair harnesses. 
Uh, because they also worked with leather, leather they were also uh, possibly making shoes for people too. And we have a display of some of the um, forms and things that were used in shoemaking. And the, uh, this wall here is a horse, a horse fly net that we also talked about when we were looking at the, the models of the horses up front. In this area, we have um, a number of artifacts that came from the railroad depot. Uh, I think some in from Barrett, some from here in Elbow Lake. The railroads were important when they came through for the pioneers. Uh, it provided uh, a larger market for them for uh, marketing their crops. Uh, it was also important for transportation, for traveling from one place to another. Where the towns, where the railroad came and stayed, uh, the towns generally thrived and grew. Uh, we have examples where they had railroads um, the rail, there was railroad for a short time. There was a railroad spur that went from Evansville over to Tinta. And along this railroad, uh, you had the villages of Erdahl. There was one also called Thorsburg, West Selva Lake, Hereford. Um, those towns, except for Erdahl, you don't hear about anymore because they disappeared. When the railroad left that, uh, abandoned that spur, those towns completely, almost completely disappeared. Um, Palm de Terre was another example. Palm de Terre was one of the first villages in, in Grand County. Um, they thought they were perfectly positioned to get the railroad. Uh, they were on the Palm de Terre River. They were on the Stagecoach Road. They were sure that the railroad would likely come through there. It was once a bustling little community. Um, but because the railroad went north through Ashby, Pondicherry eventually died out. So all that was left there of the village of Pondicherry now is the old brick school building and a, a pioneer cemetery. Back in this area, we have our, our newspaper display. Um, this large machine here in the corner was a linotype, called a linotype machine. And when it was, when it was, um, invented, it was a real time saver for newspapers. Um, prior to the invention of this machine, all the letters in a newspaper that you can see here, we have a, an example of an 1884 Herman Herald, and then also a 2003 Grant County Herald. Um, you can see all the words, tiny words, tiny printing that, on that whole page those letters all have to be set by hand, letter by letter. Um, and that's what, these are just some examples of here. These were set in trays that spelled out whatever they were, had printed in here. And it also had to be done backwards because when the paper was laid over, you, it was had to be done in a mirror image. So when you, you ink the tray with all the lettering and, and put your paper down that when you took it up, it would be right, you would be able to read it. Um, so you were not only going letter by letter, you were doing it backwards, um, a real challenge. Um, and very time consuming as you could probably figure. Um, when this linotype machine was invented, you would type on the keyboard a sentence and it would come out in a bar like this, or a line. So you had a line of type, and it was already in, done in reverse for you, so you didn't have to worry about that. And then, so instead of letter by letter for each of these, you would at least have a line at a time. So uh, quite a time saver for them. And now everything is done on computers for the newspapers. Over in the, on this side, in this area, we have a lot of the old farm equipment that we have. Um, we have a model down here on the end of McCormick's Reaper, uh, just a replica of McCormick's first Reaper that was used to cut the grain. Um, initially, pioneers would take the size, like, uh, like on the wall, they would take a scythe to cut the wheat, 
and bundle it together, then they would have to bundle it together. Um, the reaper would cut the wheat for them, they still would have to bundle it. Um, then we have over here, we have a binder that would cut it and bind the bundles into the shocks that you see if you've ever gone to a, a um, I can't think of one. <laughs> the bees by Dalton. If you've ever gone to a threshing bee uh, and seen how they work, like in Dalton or Donnelly, they have these every year. Um, they have the shocks of the shocks of wheat already bundled up. Then the combine, uh, on the back wall there, we have the, co the old combine, uh, or the threshing machine, actually, sorry. Um, this was a pretty old one. This was made out of a wood, even. The main body of it was made out of wood. Um, but you have those machines, like the, bind the, the, the reaper, the binder, threshing machine, all that was needed to do what your combines do now. Down in this end, we have a lot of our old uh, wagons and buggies, um, different places. Um, back in the corner, we have some old firefighting equipment. Uh, and this yellow wagon was a stagecoach. Uh, that was used in Grant County. It would take people like from Elbow Lake to Ashby, Elbow Lake to Herman, um, and throughout the county. And maybe you want to get. Back against this wall, we have one of the, the altar from one of the old churches. Um, this one was from Our Savior's Lutheran that was in Barrett. Uh, when the pioneer, when your pioneer ancestors first came, they spoke their own language, the Norwegians, the Swedes, the Germans, and um, consequently they each had their own churches. So you had a, a, a lot of them in this area were primarily Lutherans, but you had a German Lutheran church, a Norwegian Lutheran church, a Swedish Lutheran church, because they were speaking their own languages. Uh, as time went by, years went by, uh, Populations dwindled, uh, families were smaller, they couldn't support all these small churches, and a lot of them started combining. Um, everybody was speaking English by that time, so there was, uh, in order to support a church, they, they combined. Um, and then you had these churches that closed, and we ended up with an altar here, um, like I said, from our, sa our saviors and Freedom Church, Our Saviors was a Lutheran church, uh, Norwegian church, Freedom was a Swedish church uh, in the Barrett area. They combined to form Peace Lutheran Church in Barrett. On the stand here, we have a child's coffin. Um, and children, you know, a lot of times there were diseases that went around. Diphtheria was particularly bad um, a couple of different times there were diphtheria epidemics um, that killed off a number of children in families. So we have just a representative of a child's coffin. Um, this has opens up where you can see the, a glass where you can look through at their face. Um, one of the reasons for this, I think they thought with germs they didn't want to spread, if it was diphtheria, they didn't want germs spreading. The other thing someone else uh, told me also was that if they weren't actually dead, they thought maybe they were, but they weren't actually, if they were still breathing, you would get um, steam on the uh, backside of the glass. So kind of a creepy thought, but served a purpose. <laughs> Okay, um, a lot of this I kind of skip back. We have a corner here where we have some uh, creamery equipment, a cream separator, a big, a larger butter churn and some small, smaller butter churn um, used for making butter. And this was uh, a box It would make, if that was filled up and packed tight, it would be like a hundred pound block of butter 
and then the stamper that was used to stamp it all down. Railroad cart that was used at the uh, depot for moving luggage around. And then here we have another buggy. This uh, hide that's hanging over the front of the, the buggy was horse hide. Um, people didn't let things go to waste. So an animal died, they would use a hide like that to make blankets with to keep warm. Up on top, we have different uh, sleighs used in the winter. And the one here on the end, you can see it says uh, real route, uh, real delivery. It was used by the mailman in, for the barrack area for a number of years in the winter time. Had a little stove and everything in the corner to keep them warm. <laughs> Hiding, hiding back here, you can't see real well, are these two big film projectors, movie projectors. Um, at one time, Elbow Lake, Ashby, Hoffman, and Herman all had their own movie theaters. Um, and this is what they had showed the films on. Uh, now you have to go Alexandria, Fergus Falls, or Morris close by to see movies. Here we have the blacksmith shop. The blacksmith was also a person that was very important to the early pioneers. Uh, they would make and shoe, uh, make horseshoes and shoe horses for the, for the farmers. Um, they could make tools of just about anything out of metal. Uh, if you notice on some of the old wagons, there's like a wire, a metal rim that goes around the wheel and they would also work at uh, making and fixing those. They had the forge here, was where they built their fire, um, and then the, the bellows they would use to pump air to heat it up or let it cool down. If they needed it hotter, they would pump more air into it to, to get it heated up again. And then they would have um, the anvil and different tools that you see that they could use um, for the work that they did. Back in this corner now, we have a, we've have we kind of set this up as a temporary display area. Uh, last year, if you were here at all, we had a fur trade exhibit that we brought in from the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, right now, we have a temporary display of the Emanuel Church in uh, rural Barrett. They are trying to raise funds to uh, do some preservation work. So that's what is set up here. Our next plan is to get a, a a display of the courthouse, the decorative elements in the courthouse, and all that work has been done. And we've just been kind of working towards getting that. But in the meantime, we have this one from the Emanuel Church. Um, down this aisle, we have uh, just kind of an early um, Main Street, different, um, different shops that you might have found on Main Street. We have the dentist, the barber shop, we have a general store where you could go and order or buy just about anything that you would have needed. Something I'm going to point out in the barber shop here, barber beauty shop, I'm going to just point out uh, back in the corner that permanent wave machine. So if you parents, grandparents have ever had a permanent put in your hair, um, this was one way they did it back, back in the 20s, 30s, 40s. You can see on if you, the picture above the machine shows your hair all uh, wired up to this. It just it seems kind of scary to me with the, like having all that electricity hooked up to your, to your uh, head like that. <laughs> and we have, yeah, the drugstore, post office, music store and then we and the bank here and then we have uh, the hospital and this is uh, Powers Hospital just about everything in this display came from what was Powers Hospital which is which was in Barrett from uh, 1914 to 1941 when Dr. Powers passed away um, 
The building it's in is still there. It's a private home now. It's located uh, across from Powers Park, which was named after him. Um, so you can, you can see a lot of things. The, the one exception, main exception here as far as what didn't come out of his office was uh, this exam table that came from the old clinic in Elbow Lake. Um, back when we were by the church exhibit, I talked about the, the coffin, the child's coffin. And back here on the wall, you can see these different signs of diseases that were very common. And as you can see, they were and they would quarantine you. So it's kind of like what we are now with the COVID, which you want to state, you know, we have to stay at home for everybody. They had quarantines back then too. Um, smallpox, scarlet fever, diphtheria, measles, um, those kind of illnesses that were uh, quite common back then and unfortunately took a lot of lives of children. Here on the end, you see some of the um, items that were brought over from Norway uh, by our Norwegian ancestors. Some of the, you know, one of the things they usually brought over were exa examples of, uh, you know, things they needed to make the foods that they that they like to prepare. Um, and they had bowls and and things like that in containers. So that's some of the things that you see here. Part of our Norwegian ancestry in this area. Okay, this is our log cabin. Uh, this was moved here from the Grant Douglas County border southeast of Pelican Lake. It was built in 1865 by a Norwegian immigrant named Ole Halverson Floor. Uh, he and his wife and his son um, built this place. The story goes that uh, well, they only had the one child, which was really uncommon back in those days when it was much more common to have probably eight, 10, 12 kids in a family. Um, the story goes that the mother was um, injured somehow when they were building this cabin and was unable to have any more children. But Peter, their son Peter grew up and raised 10 kids in this house. Uh, plus, he had his parents living here until they died also. So at one time, as many as 14 people in this house. Um, they had three beds and the one room upstairs for seven girls to share, and a bed and a cot for three boys in the other room upstairs. Um, the other room over here, I guess, was like for his parents until they died. So mom and dad, Peter and his wife, um, evidently had some kind of a pull out bed or something in, in this room that uh, that they used every night. In this room where the, uh, this cabin had been uh, lived in up until about the mid 1960s. It had been sited over and added on to over the years, but it had been used that long. Uh, and you can see in this room here where uh, in the late 40s they did add electricity in here. Um, one thing you'll notice in here is that the stairs are quite steep. Uh, if you think about your stairway in your house now, uh, they'll probably take up pretty much a whole wall um, in a room. Uh, even, and even though this cabin was quite large for the time it was built, um, they still needed to save as much room as possible so, so you have a steeper stairway, much more steep than what we're used to nowadays. 